Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. George was making his rounds, walking the property one last time before dark. He was a career groundskeeper who liked to bounce around from location to location for a few years at a time. He never liked the idea of being tied down to one place for a long period of time, so he took on the role of a freelance groundskeeper, as he called it. He had worked at the Durkee Mansion in Wisconsin, Turnbald Mansion in Minneapolis, and up until a month ago, the Mueller Schmidt House in Dodge City, Kansas. But now he was happily working at his new place of employment, the Glensheen Mansion in Duluth, Minnesota. He had just finished walking the perimeter and was sauntering down the long driveway towards the house. He squinted his eyes at the mansion as he chewed the end of his sniped Durango cigar, hands buried in his pockets, and marveled at the integrity of the impressive structure. As he stood looking, he thought he saw the figure of a woman walk by one of the second-story windows. He blinked a few times and focused harder, eventually chalking it up to the sunset casting a weird glare on the window. He pulled his keys out of his pocket and approached the golf cart that was parked at the semicircle driveway by the door. That's when an ear-piercing scream came from inside the house. George almost jumped right out of his boots. The scream had been so loud and he knew the house had been empty at the time. Unsure of what was going on, he hurried to the front door and fumbled with his keys trying to find the right one to unlock the door. Another scream came from inside the house as he plunged the key into the lock and twisted the knob. He called out to whoever was screaming as he ascended the stairs to the second floor. Again, the agonized scream echoed through the long halls, sending chills down George's spine. He got more and more anxious as he got closer to the source of the screaming, unsure of what he was going to find. The house should have been empty, and he couldn't seem to piece together who could have gotten in and why they would be screaming. George slowed his pace as he figured out where the screaming was coming from. He was a few feet away from the doorway to Helena's bedroom. The door was wide open, no light was on, and the sun had since ducked away below the horizon. Someone was sitting in that dark room, screaming by herself. George was struck with an imminent feeling of dread. Now that he was there, he wanted nothing more than to not be there. He called out from his position, ten feet from the door, too unnerved to look inside. He tried calling out, who was in there, but was cut off by another ear-piercing scream. What kind of man would leave a woman in danger, he thought to himself. He put his fear aside and marched toward the room. He reached the doorway and looked in. To his shock, there was nobody inside. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, The Glensheen Mansion, Duluth, Minnesota. Sitting on 22 acres in Duluth, Minnesota, is the Glensheen Mansion. The sprawling estate has 39 rooms and is a massive 27,000 square feet. Originally designed by renowned architect Clarence H. Johnson, construction on the single-family home began in 1905. Chester Congdon, who earned his fortune in the iron business, spared no expense when having his family's dream home built, and he hired the best of the best to handle the construction as well as the landscaping. William A. French designed the interior, and the family moved into the mansion in 1908. Construction would continue for a few months, and it would be completed in 1909. The total cost of the Glensheen Mansion was over $850,000 at the time, which is roughly around $22 million in today's dollars. The property included some rare features that were not widely available at the time, including hot water and electricity. Chester would only live in the house for eight years before his death in 1916, while his wife Clara remained in the home for another 34 years until her death in 1950, leaving the home to their last surviving daughter, Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth had been in and out of the mansion since her childhood. 
She attended boarding school in Massachusetts and went to college in New York in 1915. When her father passed away, she moved back to Glensheen Mansion to care for her mother and be with her siblings. Elizabeth was well-loved around town and was very charitable. She volunteered at the local hospital and started a women's clinic with Dr. Elizabeth Bagley. She kept herself busy and never married. She did have a long-term relationship with a man named Fred Wolven. He proposed several times, but she refused. She started a family anyways, adopting a three-month-old baby girl from North Carolina, renaming her Marjorie after her older sister. She would adopt a second girl three years later, naming her Jennifer. This was when Marjorie started acting a bit odd. As an only child, Marjorie was already shy. Staff at the mansion described her as shy and introverted. Her behavior worsened when she was introduced to Jennifer. Marjorie was described as being short and stocky and had to wear thick glasses because of her poor eyesight. Jennifer was quite the opposite. She was the perfect child, and this created tension between the sisters. Marjorie's behavior went from being shy and introverted to being more of a problem child when her favorite uncle suddenly died. She was seen laughing maniacally at nothing and even started pulling out her own hair. Elizabeth tried everything, even spoiling Marjorie, hoping this would help her, but it did not. At 13 years old, Marjorie desperately wanted a horse, and she would beg her mother constantly. Elizabeth finally gave in, but Marjorie immediately lost interest in the animal. Frustrated, Elizabeth decided to sell the horse. One evening, Elizabeth made her way outside to check on the horse. She hadn't seen Marjorie for a while, but it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she assumed that she must be off reading in a dark corner of the mansion somewhere. As she made her way into the stable, there was Marjorie. It looked as though she was attempting to feed the horse. Elizabeth was surprised, but almost pleased to see this. Maybe her daughter was finally coming around and wanted to take care of her new pet. But again, Elizabeth was wrong. A shocked Marjorie turned around and ran from the stable when she saw her mother dropping the bowl that she had in her hands. Elizabeth looked down at the contents that were spilling out, and it was not food, but pills. Marjorie felt that if she couldn't have her horse, nobody could. Her behavior did not improve, and at 16 she was sent off to Massachusetts to study at Dana Hall. When she returned to Minnesota, she immediately began stealing money from her mother. Elizabeth had had enough. She sent her off to a clinic in Topeka, Kansas. Marjorie was diagnosed as being a sociopath in 1949 at 17 years old. After leaving the institution, her behavior began to change. She learned to act more charming in order to manipulate those around her to get what she wanted. She met a 23-year-old insurance underwriter named Richard Webster, and one year later, the two got married at the mansion. Her sister Jennifer was a maid of honor at the wedding. Richard was extremely intelligent and successful, later becoming a stockbroker. They would have seven children together, moving around the country every few years. She was described as a perfect wife by neighbors, entertaining guests, and having expensive parties. But this picture-perfect life that she seemed to be living began to crack, and she was even suspected of arson when accidental fires broke out in two of their homes. Their marriage began to fall apart due to her reckless spending habits, and after 19 years of marriage and racking up over a million dollars of debt, Richard filed for divorce. Elizabeth had helped out as much as she could by sending the couple over $300,000 to chip away at their debt. In 1968, Elizabeth Congdon suffered a stroke, sending her into a week-long coma. She suffered hearing loss and brain damage, leaving her paralyzed on the right side of her body. She was confined to a wheelchair and depended on a full-time nurse as well as round-the-clock staff around the house. Following the decline of her health, with Elizabeth's permission, the family decided to donate the mansion to the University of Minnesota Duluth. This would only take place in the event of her death, and she stayed at the home until that happened. In 1971, Elizabeth's sister died, leaving all the family's finances and decision-making to Elizabeth. She decided it was time to stop sending money to her daughter Marjorie due to her reckless spending. By this time, Marjorie had met a new man, and two months later, she married Roger Caldwell. She even promised in an affidavit that she would give over two and a half million dollars out of her eight million dollar payout upon the death of her mother whenever that would be. Just three days after making this promise, on June 27, 1977, Elizabeth Congdon was found dead, murdered in her bed, smothered by a satin pillow. 
Her nurse, Velma, was also found dead at the top of the staircase, bludgeoned with a candlestick. Velma was hit so hard with this candlestick that it actually split at the base. Jennifer immediately suspected her sister as the one responsible for the murders. Several items were missing from the crime scene, including a basket of jewelry and a Byzantine-era coin which was worth a small fortune. Family noticed that Marjorie's behavior during the funeral was a little bit more upbeat than it should be. This only fed their suspicions that she may have been involved in the double homicide. Family also noticed that Roger Caldwell had cuts on his face and a swollen right hand, which he claimed were injuries from being kicked by a horse. Investigators searched the couple's hotel room and found a heap of incriminating evidence, including the missing basket of jewelry as well as a self-addressed letter. Inside this envelope was the Byzantine-era coin from Glensheen Mansion, and on the back of it was Caldwell's thumbprint. At the crime scene, police matched bloodstains to Roger's blood type and arrested him for the double murder. Marjorie never visited Caldwell in jail, and she did not attend his trial. She claimed that she had been attacked by an officer who threatened to have her killed if she involved herself in the case. She arrived at the police station with cuts on her face and wrist, but officers immediately recognized that these wounds seemed to be self-inflicted and they sent her on her way. Roger would be found guilty and was handed two back-to-back -back life sentences. Marjorie was also eventually charged for conspiracy, but unlike her husband, she was able to hire one of Minnesota's top defense attorneys, Ron Meshbesher. During her trial, she never really looked up from her chair, even knitting while they went over the gruesome details of her own mother's death. She also baked a birthday cake for one of her lawyers and brought it into the courtroom for the jury to see. The prosecution brought a doctor to the stand who testified that Marjorie had been responsible for a previous murder attempt on her own mother by poisoning her. Marjorie had shown up to Glensheen Mansion one day out of the blue with her homemade marmalade that she insisted that her mother just had to try. Elizabeth fell deathly ill for days after eating Marjorie's creation, and the doctor concluded that she had been poisoned by tranquilizers mixed into the marmalade. However, Marjorie's defense team had their own expert to bring to the stand. They called a fingerprint expert to the stand, who concluded that the fingerprints on the letter found in their hotel room was absolutely not a match to Roger Caldwell's. Despite her odd behavior and demeanor during the trial, the prosecution failed to convince the jury that she had anything to do with the murders and the charges were dropped. Due to the testimony from the fingerprint expert, the Supreme Court would eventually overturn Roger Caldwell's conviction and he would be released from prison in exchange for a guilty plea after just five years. Roger would end up committing suicide by slashing his wrists in 1988 in Pennsylvania, leaving three suicide notes. The only legible note claimed that he was innocent of these murders, and to his knowledge, never physically hurt anyone in his life. However, this was just one week after Roger's new fiancé had to be hospitalized because he nearly beat her to death. Roger also never received the $2.5 million that he was promised from Marjorie. Marjorie went on to marry a man named Wally Hagen in 1981, while she was still technically married to Roger, but somehow avoided being charged of bigamy. Wally's previous wife died mysteriously in her nursing home after a visit from Marjorie, where she was seen feeding her something from a jar. In 1984, she would be charged with arson for burning down her and Wally's home that they had just sold, and she would be sentenced to 21 months in prison. In 1992, she would be caught red-handed trying to burn down her neighbor's house while he was still inside. She was given 15 years, but for some reason, she was granted one more night to murder her husband. He was found on the night before Halloween in 1992 from an apparent suicide. She claimed that they had a suicide pact together, but of course, she just couldn't go through with it. Authorities weren't buying it and they charged her with murder. They suspected that he was gassed, but the autopsy showed that he had died of an apparent overdose. Due to a lack of evidence, once again, the charges were dropped. She was released in 2004 and went right back to jail for computer fraud. She had been ripping off a man named Roger Sammies, who had been under her care just before he died under mysterious circumstances. Well, back at Glensheen Mansion, ghost sightings were becoming more common and the building was earning a reputation as a hotbed for paranormal activity. Lights mysteriously turn on and off by themselves and they flicker. Staff would shut off all of the lights before locking up for the night, only to look back and notice them turned on again on the second floor. 
a strange white mist has been seen in the library. Many believe this is the ghost of Elizabeth, who was an avid reader in life. Some say her ghost returns to the library as it was one of her favorite rooms in the mansion. Dark shadow figures have been seen darting around the basement by several visitors to the home, and many have reported feeling like they were being watched as they move throughout the estate. Disembodied screams have been heard inside and outside of the house, followed by the sighting of two female ghosts that can be seen staring out of Elizabeth's bedroom window. Many believe these could be the ghosts of Velma and Elizabeth herself, who were both murdered on that floor. Tour guides at Glensheen do not discuss the murders and are ordered not to talk about ghosts. However, during a tour of the mansion, a video was captured that made news headlines, as it appeared to show a mannequin-like figure moving throughout a room. It also appears to show a red glow around his head and neck area. Employees were confused by the video, since it not only appears to be moving, but there are also no mannequins that look anything like this in the house. The murders at Glensheen are technically still unsolved. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the serial con artist, arsonist with a trail of dead husbands behind her might just be the guilty party here. The question is, are Velma and Elizabeth still haunting the site where they were both brutally murdered? And are their spirits fated to remain at Glensheen until the truth is revealed? I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, The Glensheen Mansion, Minnesota. Hello and welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 65, Duluth, Minnesota, the Glensheen Mansion. I'm Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. I learn so much from every episode that either I cover or that you guys cover. And I now personally cannot wait until I Ron Meshbesher Dave to death one day. <laughs> Ron Meshbesher was just the lawyer, but that's fine. Uh, he's going to... Um... It's it's a new way. He's gonna get Dave out of jail. That's that's, that's what he's gonna do. What's up, Dave? What's going on? Hopefully, I don't need Ron Meshbesher to get me out of jail anytime soon. Yeah, there was a there was a whole lot of uh, crazy names in this. You had Ron Meshbesher, uh, Richard Caldwell. Uh, yep. Was it, it? It was either. Hang on. Was it Richard or was it? I, I don't. One of the, one of them was just named Dick, but it was like Dick Caldwell or something like that, and I just couldn't. I couldn't Dick say Dick Caldwell right was on the case. <laughs> There's so many wild names in this uh in this episode this story is is crazy it just kept going like i i tried not to get so sidetracked away from the mansion but you couldn't not mention that this woman not only is is probably allegedly a serial killer allegedly allegedly but she's like a serial arsonist she can't stop burning stuff down i didn't mention but there's like hundreds of cases that she's suspected of arson like hundreds of arson cases in Arizona, in Minnesota, in Colorado, like all these different places that she lived in, she's suspected of burning down like at least 20 houses. She's an absolute crazy person. She's insane. And she won't stop poisoning people too. She's poisoning everyone. She tried to poison the horse. She's just, she has this lifelong behavior pattern of either trying to poison someone to death, burning houses down, and, uh, and orchestrating murders. It's, it's, it's wild. And it's just, it's, and she has a lifelong history of completely evading the law until she was like a senior citizen. And they finally caught her, uh, trying to burn down her neighbor's house, which is like ridiculous, right? The amount of st time she was like, well, there's just no evidence. She must be the only one that, uh, no one else could have done this. She was the only one here. She has done this 13 times in the past, but whatevs she's innocent. Like, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. We're going to, We'll, we'll jump into all of it. First of all, let's uh, welcome everyone who's hanging out in live chat here. We have a large group of people. Actually, we've hit a new milestone. This is the most people that we've had in a live stream. So thank you, guys. I feel like we're saying that every week, and that is a good thing. That means we're moving in the right direction. But I see uh, Brandon. I see Brandon. I see Papa Squatch. Ian is here. Huggies Hauntings is here for the first time. Welcome in. I see Andrew as well. 
Lily is here. Uh, Captain McSlugs, everybody else, the Stephanies. Appreciate you all for hanging out. We have uh, a, the same group here that was here during the patron pre-show hangout, which was a good time. So I want to thank you guys for uh, hanging out during that. Always fun. If you want to join in these pre-show hangouts a couple times a month for uh, the $10 and up tiers, we have Patreon hangouts and it's always a good time. So it's good chat, to see some new faces. Chat has there. a pretty interesting theory that the horse is behind it all. And I am fully on board with that theory. Yes. I explain. I want to deep dive into how the horse is, is responsible, Dave. So the horse is responsible for all of the poisonings and the arson and um, everything the else. The murders, obviously. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the the explanation is simple. Mm. It's that it's a, a bad horse. Of course. Uh, of course. Of course, indeed. Of course, I indeed. Th I think that will hold up in a court of law. Uh, apparently in Minnesota, Minnesota it will. Because <laughs> I, how the hell... The the amount of evidence that they had, how did they? Let, let's just start with that because obviously the, the case in the hauntings revolve around the double murder that happened at this place. So they catch these guys, and it's it's pretty obvious, right? They had already all suspected it immediately. Jennifer, her sister, as soon as the murder happened, as soon as her mother was murdered, she's like, "Oh, that was Marjorie for sure." Like 100, percent she orchestrated this. She needed the money. They wanted to, she was begging her mother for money. She was already, she's got all these crazy spending habits. She's been blowing through everyone's money her entire life. She's just a spoiled brat and she just spends all this money. Now she had a bunch of these like trust funds set up. So every few years she would get like another 500 K from her family because she was just, you know, she was adopted into this family and she was, this is what she was used to. So when she didn't have it, she would find other ways of getting the money, whether it was arson for insurance fraud um, now, most of the times that she was doing these, uh, she's burning down these houses. It seemed like it was somewhat connected to some sort of insurance thing, but it also seemed like she was doing it because she really liked to do it. She was just burning down all the houses in the neighborhood, basically. She's a psychopath, allegedly. And the, um, I, I just completely lost my train of thought. So that's good. It's good news. Well, the good thing, the good thing about her burning down the houses is if she were, is she still alive? She's still alive and not in jail. She's in, well, Marjorie, living in Arizona. Marjorie, let me look at the camera. Let me tell you this. In the next short few days or weeks, we are introducing the $50 Patreon tear, where if you sign up for the $50 Patreon tear, Jesse will go burn down a house for you. So that's not true. But if if she wants to and she wants to join and donate a lot of money, we'll delete that. We'll delete this episode just for you, Marjorie. <laughs> <laughs> it's very incriminating. Um Okay, so the court case was what we were talking about. Okay, so here, here's where we were. I completely lost my train of thought. So I wasn't even reading the chat. This is my own fault. Too much to think about in this episode, but we're talking about all of the evidence that they had against him, right? So immediately she mm -hmm. suspected. Immediately everyone's like, this has got to be Marjorie. First of all, why didn't she just wait? Like her mother had just had a huge stroke or heart attack or whatever. She was already in terrible condition. She's around, like she's going to die pretty much any day now anyways. And you idiots went and murdered her. Like this is, it's first of all, it's an awful thing to do. Second of all, she's on her way out the door. You could have just waited. She was, she was going to get her $8 million in uh, insurance or in inheritance. And she meets this new guy. I think she marries him just to hire him to kill her mother because she signs this affidavit uh, and she is going to, she basically promises him $2.5 million as soon as his mother dies which is what sparked all like the investigators interest to like, that's super suspicious. She just met this guy two months ago, just married him. And now she's going to use him to, you know, probably, but why would she give this guy $2.5 million right away? It's crazy. So I think here, here's, here's my theory on it. They find all of this evidence. There's no reason for her to tell Roger to steal these items, right? The basket of jewelry and the random coin. Why? You're just going to, like, when, when she dies, you're going to get that stuff anyways. Why would you steal things? Maybe to make it look like a robbery? I think she told him to take those things, or she was there and she took them herself just to pin this whole thing on Roger. I think that was her plan from the beginning. Meet this guy. He was like a raging alcoholic. Meet this guy. Convince him to do this crime. Offer him two and a half million dollars, and then completely stage it so you can pin the whole thing on him. That's my theory. I think she's the mastermind. And this was also the theory of a few police officers. Uh, so it's not your theory. <laughs> this is the theory that I agree with. Well, 
there there is a glaring problem in it and i'll get to that in one second first thing is brendan said in the chat it's a lack of patience and unfortunately the guns and roses song patience wasn't out at this point to help her cope with the amount of time for this the problem with your theory is you just went through this thorough theory that sounds reasonable but you didn't do it in a minnesotan accent and i can't believe you anymore and I don't think I it thought, holds water this, because of it. This whole time, we, me and Dave sat here patiently waiting for you to say something with some substance to it. And you didn't. So, Dave, yeah, what are your thoughts you, on that? You're still not speaking in a Minnesota accent, so it still doesn't count. Relax. I just want to hear Dave's theory. <laughs> My theory? I already said it. I thought it was the horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, and then... Uh, don't bring Roger. You can't bring him to the funeral. He's got cuts all over him. He's got a swollen right hand. Like he just looks like he's fresh off a of murder. You might not want to bring him to the funeral. Everyone's like, look at this asshole. I think this guy did it. They already <laughs> suspect you and you show up and you claim that you got kicked by a horse. It's, it's a bad, it's a bad, uh, it's a bad excuse. Not the greatest alibi there. Uh, so I don't know. I don't she, think she also, they knew that she like, did stuff to herself, like claiming that it was right. Um, police officers. Like, yeah. So I heard about this one on a podcast and I'll pull up the name of it. I hadn't read that theory anywhere, but I heard it about it in this podcast. And it was a pretty thorough podcast. So I believe them, but they said that she had gone to the police um, with very obvious self-inflicted wounds and said that an officer had come to her hotel room and threatened her life. If she got herself involved in the case, which was her excuse not to visit Roger in jail at all and not to go and not to show up in court and testify for him or anything like that, which just leans me further towards the belief that she absolutely wanted him to be found guilty of all of this stuff. And Stephanie brings up that she's a spoiled psychopathic, uh, psychopathic, narcissistic bitch, plain and simple. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even know that getting diagnosed with being a sociopath was a thing. I mean, I think this was back in like the forties or something. So I guess that would, a different time but i think it is something that you could be diagnosed with right it's path pathology right so sociopath um but brennan brought up a couple of times that this reminds him of butch defeo uh from the amityville case where you have somebody who had clear mental issues psychological problems and rather than getting him help or getting her help they just throw money at him you know and that's kind of what happened with with marjorie here also right they threw a lot more money at her but they they did try to get her help i mean they did send her away to an institution she came back she was a little bit changed and you got to give it to like her first husband i mean they, they stuck it out for 19 years and had seven kids that's a lot that's a deep you know that's longer than most marriages here in the united states i mean they seemed like they were living a pretty normal life but the whole time it seemed to be that she was just kind of she had this fake image to her where she's pretending to be the perfect wife. And meanwhile, she's suspected of a bunch of arson cases in her, <laughs> in her area. So um, I'd like to point out that we are all narcissists. And if you would like to help us solve this problem by throwing money at us, we would greatly appreciate it. And it yeah. would help tremendously. Look at us on our high, our high horse, our high murderous horse. Mm. While well, we have a Patreon set up. <laughs> That's right. Just just a bunch of Marjories over here. That's what's going on. That's true. It is true. What? Yep. Um, I like I like Bro Dad's comment in the chat. He said that maybe she was a suedo path. Suedo path. A suedo. <laughs> exactly. So uh so, so they find Roger guilty and they sentence him to prison, and then they they or they sentence him for the back to back life sentences is what he gets. And then they charge Marjorie with conspiracy because they all know she had something to do with it. It's blatantly obvious. And she hires, she has the money because of the money that she inherited, which her sister was like, don't give her that money. She shouldn't have that, you know, this these funds because she's being charged with killing the woman. How are you going to give her this money? But she spent the money on a high-powered attorney, Ron Meshbesher. And Meshbesher is just the best lawyer in town and somehow just completely convinces this dumbass jury that she had nothing to do with this. And they called a fingerprint expert to the stand. I had heard rumors that it was the same fingerprint expert that was called during the OJ Simpson trial, but I couldn't find anything to back that up. So that's why I didn't talk about it on the episode, but that is an interesting connection if that is in fact true, but they had brought a fingerprint expert to the stand and he absolutely 
he said with a hundred percent, without a doubt in his mind, the fingerprint that was on the back of that envelope was not Roger Caldwell. And, um, and this not only got her off, but it also went, made them, it, it made it up to the Supreme court and it ended up getting Roger off on the case. Gross. Gross. What? Oh, stop it. You're so immature. Anyway. So it got, let them get away with murder, if you will, allegedly. So um, it, it was, was like, he, he was sure about the fingerprint that it was not that fingerprint, but could he be sure that it wasn't a hoof print? Ooh. Oof. So who, who said it was his fingerprint then? This was the initial evidence that they convicted him on the first time. And this landed him in jail. And this was like the only solid evidence because they also found jewelry, but they said, you know, she had said, no, that's my jewelry. It wasn't missing from the house. I was there. I just grabbed it last time I was there because it's mine. So it was kind of hard to prove that anything was legitimately there. But the one thing that was like the solid piece of evidence that they had, other than his blood being at the scene, I don't, I don't know how they overturn either of these because this one made it up all the way to the Supreme Court. So this is after Marjorie gets acquitted of these crimes. They don't find her guilty. They use that same testimony to then pass his court up in the appeals process up to the Supreme Court. And they're like, OK, in exchange for a guilty plea, we're going to give you time served. This was five years after he had been sent to jail for the murders. So he ended up only serving five years for a double murder, which he ended up pleading guilty to because he still signed the plea agreement. And they're, what is going on in Minnesota where they're like, OK, well, as long as he says he's guilty, we'll let this brutal murderer who killed two people go after five years. Explain that process to me. I don't get it. Just so they can get their guilty stamp. Cool. Well, you let your guilty guy go after five years. So just just be around money, just like be in the vicinity of money and you somehow you don't get in trouble for like anything or you just get a relative slap on the wrist in relation to what anyone else would get. Right. It's five years for a double murder. Yeah. Lily brings up the cake. So the other thing that she did was like, so she never really looked up from her seat. She was literally knitting in court and she baked a cake for her attorney, which was like a big show where she brings in this birthday cake and gives it to the attorney and the whole jury's like, Oh, what a nice grandma move. Like this is, what a nice lady. How could she be? How could they even dare accuse her of this? And then when she got found innocent, they said like members of the jury stepped out just to go give her a hug and be like, yeah, you get to go home now. You're, you're what innocent. We're sorry you had to go through this. It's like, how stupid can you, can you folks be? It's, it's insane. But I, I, I mean, Hey, that's the power of the mesh besher, as I like to say. <laughs> that's you know? true. So after, after I get rid of Dave, uh, allegedly, and I'm on trial for it, if this chick can like knit, I better be able to like put the show together during the trial or something like that. Because what are we doing here? Why are we, why are we allowing activities during court? Yeah, that end. I mean, these are things that could be used as a murder weapon, right? You could strangle yeah. someone with the yarn, could poke them with the little metal sticks that she uses. Yeah, it's a little, Dangerous stuff. Sorry for doing that motion. Uh, I won't do that again. <laughs> so am I, am I, let me know if I'm mixing up the timeline and the events was she not on trial for poisoning someone no so they had brought that up in in trial so they had brought this up during hers they called in um a doctor who was at the house when she had um poisoned her mother and he was like not only would she orchestrate something like this but i was there when she tried it the first time and they didn't have solid evidence, but she brought over her marmalade for only her mother and only her mother tried it. And she became deathly ill. And the doctor had found like tranquilizers in her system that she obviously wasn't taking on her own. So right. it was like, it must've been mixed in with the marmalade. And that was, uh, it was just, she had showed up this, just out of this, nowhere. And this same lady brought cake in for everyone. And they were like, wonderful. I was like, wait, she it was a birthday, cake. It was a birthday she... cake for mesh besher. And all I know is you don't eat mesh besher's cake. That's just for Mesh Besher. He eats the whole thing on his mm. birthday. This is such a Minnesota story. It's so that's, strange. She might be guilty, but she's a nice old lady, eh? Like, yeah. that's, he, there it is. She made a birthday cake. Yeah. Did, didn't you see her knitting, eh? Yeah, it's just... I, all I can think of is, like, the Amber Heard trial and, like, her demeanor at the uh, on the stand. And I'm just like, that didn't fly these days, but if, if it's in Minnesota... I don't know. These people like, like, oh, well, if she's doing this, she must be innocent. I don't, I don't know. It was just, 
yeah, I'm not touching that cake, Donnie. Everyone seems to be like, yeah, I would not touch that cake. Yeah, the, the this lady who's been poisoning people and horses her entire life, you bake me something, I'm punting that thing across the courtroom. <laughs> like, get, yeah. this, get this cake away from me. So, yeah, we got uh, we got Rob for finally doing an accent on the show. All it took was doing a Midwest episode. Look at that. See, I do. See, what people don't know is I do them all on the show before we go live with just the three of us. I just knock out accents. I get them out of my system so that I don't have to do them. And uh, show you two up, basically. I don't want right. to show. Yeah, my, of course. Yeah, show how good I am at these accents. Doesn't take much to show up me with an accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did did he really eat some of the cake? I don't know if he actually ate it in court. I would not have. Honestly, like if my client is is being <laughs> accused of poisoning, accused of people. murder and poisoning people, no, I'm not going to eat a single thing you give to me. So. Maybe he did, and they're like, "Wow, if he trusts her, I trust her." Maybe it was all just a ploy. They stopped the stop and shop on the way to the courtroom, and he's like, "Don't you, you don't touch this until you <laughs> hand it to me in court. <laughs> you bake this at home. Take the sticker off." Yeah. So uh, that was that, and then uh, so basically, they both got off. Roger ended up committing suicide, slashed his wrists, and left a bunch of suicide notes. And the third one, I guess. No, this was a legitimate. So I don't think she barged in and slashed his wrist, but I mean, I guess we don't put anything past her, but he had uh, left a suicide note saying that he was completely innocent, that he never did the murders or never committed the murders. And not only that, he had never hurt anyone. And I mentioned this in the episode, just because it's like, you can't really trust this guy anyways, because he had said he never hurt anybody in, physically in his entire life. And his fiance was still in the hospital because he almost beat her to death. It's like, well, I don't think the jury's still out on that one. But then again, it's Minnesota, so who knows? Mm. But I think he killed himself in a different state. I think it was in Colorado or something like that. No, it was Pennsylvania, actually. So either it way, it doesn't really make a difference. But So he's gone, and then before that happened, she actually remarried this other guy, and be, it, she, she remarried this other guy while she was still technically married to Roger, and this is another crime that she never got convicted of. I, I had read on one website that she still wanted for bigamy for doing this. But it's, they're not going to track down some ninety-year-old lady in Arizona for this. But at this point, I mean, I'm not just pin anything on her because she needs to. I be mean, of it. all the things, though, like whatever, because like everything else is just charge her with something, you idiots. <laughs> something. This woman is not okay. She nobody is safe around her, and so she doesn't get in trouble for that. But then this guy was married when she met him, so was she, and his wife mysteriously dies after a visit from Marjorie. She was in a nursing home. She went in there. Apparently she had adjusted her will or something like that. The nurses at the nursing home said that they saw her feeding her baby food out of a jar. And then she died that night. And then somehow Marjorie had ordered her to be cremated before like an official tox report could be done or something. And I'm just like, how she's like Dexter Morgan. How is she figuring all this stuff out? Like, how does she get around the law and not get charged with this stuff? It's it's insane. So then she marries this guy and she convinces him that he has cancer. I didn't get the, in this in the episode. She convinces him that he has cancer and they move in Arizona near the like the Tijuana border. And she keeps going over the border to get him alternative medicine that's oh, no. keeping him sick for years. She ends up getting locked up for the arson case. And while she's in, while she's being lo- being held for the arson case, all of a sudden he starts feeling better. He's like, everything's fine. So she ends up getting 15 years for trying to burn down her neighbor's house. And for some reason, now this isn't even Minnesota. Now we're talking about Arizona. For some reason, he, she's like, I need to go back because my, uh, I need to get my husband's business or his will and everything in order for him because he's been sick with cancer. So I need one day. They're like, okay. You can go home for one more day, but don't burn any houses down. So she goes home for the one night, the day before Halloween. And that night her husband dies. And she's she's like, he committed this is, suicide. This is the one he was poisoned. She was poisoning. She was poisoning him for a while, but that's not how he died. He ended up dying of a drug overdose. And she said that they had a suicide pact together. But she <laughs> is still alive today. <laughs> So she couldn't go through She's the She's getting suicide. around to it. She didn't oh, she, doesn't the, necessarily have to be at the same time. <laughs> the one night before she goes away for 15 years. Now, either he knew something that she didn't want to get out, or I think it's I think it goes back to the horse thing. I think it goes back to if I can't have him, nobody can. Right. Mm. 
is why she was trying to poison her horse back in the beginning. Literally nobody's safe around this woman. It's crazy. So serves 15 years and we're going to get into the hauntings next, but just, I like, I can't wrap my head around this story. It's insane how much she avoided the law. She didn't even serve the full 15 years before that, the previous arson case where she burnt down her own house that she had just sold, but still had insurance on it because it hadn't like crossed over yet. So she had burned down her own house. She did. She got sentenced to 15 months. I think that time. And she only served like eight of them. And then this one, she gets 15 years, but she only serves like 10 of them. She's just always just, I don't know. She's, evading the law it's it's amazing anyways it's crazy, uh, she gets, she's like she's like this big like this criminal mastermind basically but she has all these like mental problems too it's like this like you think like that type of person isn't capable of you know being a criminal mastermind like that but right it's, it's she was weird. just this is how they said she was when she got out of like the the mental institution was she was um just she had become really manipulative and she had changed like before she was just like a, she was shy and she was just spoiled and a problem child or whatever. But when she came back, she was like real tricky and this is kind of how she was the rest of her life and probably still is. So then even, even after like this, the big prison sentence, she gets out and she just goes right back to jail because she's back at it again. This time she like scams this guy out of his money. Um, he was under her care. I don't know how she was allowed to take care of anybody. And he mysteriously dies. It's it's just, it never stops with this woman. There's like 11. I think there's 11 people that died that uh, she's probably behind. Allegedly. Allegedly. That's crazy. Yeah, it's a wild story. So she, like convinced, circles, but... she convinced the husband that he had cancer. Mm -hmm. And the thought is that she was going down to Mexico to get drugs that were keeping him sick. Well, he's keeping him alive. That's so, yeah. So Whoa. she was seeking the alternative medicine, but in reality, she was probably going to Tijuana and just getting him some kind of drugs that were keeping him sick. And Intentionally, what's that called? That's uh, Munchausen by proxy, right? Sure, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> oh, we're like, you see, like cases where parents do it to their kids, they keep the kids sick, they give the kid the medicine to keep the kids sick, basically, for whether they're collecting like, um, Charity yeah, money right. for it and yep. stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's the name of it. I think somebody might have brought it up in chat. Okay. Yeah, possibly. But yes. So that yeah, that's what I think it was. Obviously, she was doing the opposite because when she had gone away for a little bit, I think maybe when she was serving like the 10 month sentence or whatever, when she was gone, all of a sudden he's like perfectly fine, didn't need the medicine anymore. He's like, Wow, I feel great. And then she gets back, she's like, No, you still have cancer. But on uh, so the the final straw with that one was when he did finally die uh, from his suicide pact or whatever. Um, they did the autopsy on him, and there was absolutely no traces of cancer whatsoever. So she was lying the entire time. Yeah, that's allegedly insane. What a um, crazy person. The interesting. Let's talk about the ghosts for a little bit mm -hmm. because I find what I find interesting about these ghosts is. We're talking about this old mansion that was built in the 1890s, but the ghosts that we're talking about are much more modern than the ghosts that we're used to dealing with. You know, we could be, could be. Yeah. Theory. So there's, there's a few in the house and we can hop into it now. So, I mean, the, the, basically the, the story is a lot of, a lot of dead people, a lot of mysterious circumstances, not a lot of convictions, not a lot of time in jail. And she's, as far as I know, she's still alive and free in Arizona living down there. So take that information. And um, yeah, I don't know. I would say she's probably harmless, but she's doing most of this as like an older woman, <laughs> older woman anyways. Dude, she's yeah. Nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. But the hauntings at the house, they, it could be, anyone from the past like 120 years right so it was built and completed in i think people moved in in 1905 right so early 1900s we're talking about but there's mm -hmm. ghost sightings of people in period clothing and it could be chester and his wife they could be haunting the place i'm pretty sure they both died in in the house and then obviously the murders and then that's where you're talking about the more recent ghosts where obviously the most um frequent sighting is the two women that are standing in the windows and people think because it's on the second floor that they see this they actually count the windows over to which one that they saw her in and, or both of them in and it, it ends up being elizabeth's bedroom which according to a few different sources she was smothered to death either in helena's bedroom or her own bedroom maybe she just kind of crashed wherever she felt like that night's big mansion she was pretty much living there with just her nurses at the time 
I read so. that it was in Helena's bedroom. Yep, I did. But a, I read in a couple other spots that was different. With a silk pillow, right? Satin. Satin. Luxury mm-hmm. must be nice. Mm-hmm. Go out like a champion too. Yeah, and apparently it was it was pretty brutal. Like that sounds like, of you know, compared to her nurse, a much easier way to go, right? It, you're not getting clubbed over the head with a candlestick. Also, somebody mentioned in chat, like this is real life clue, right? You just have this big mansion and. Mm-hmm. Velma dies via candlestick at the top of the staircase, and Elizabeth is either in Elizabeth's bedroom or Helena's bedroom with the, smothered with a satin pillow. Yeah. It's yeah, it's uh definitely sounds a lot like Clue. We should definitely make a hometown ghost stories Clue game out of this mansion, and we can be like the investigators. Then we can have Bucky McHat as one of the other characters. Yeah, <laughs> well, he uh, says died in bougie. <laughs> <laughs> Fancy way to go. Yeah. Sad way to go, but it, but apparently it was still pretty brutal. So like like I said, obviously it sounds like the lesser of the two, and it obviously was. But I think when they find her the next morning, like the pillow was like still like stuffed in her mouth, like it wasn't just like placed over her face, like you see in the movies. Like this was this was done with um with a lot of hate. So whether it was Roger, whether it was Marjorie, or both of them, I think Marjorie was at least in the house when this happened. And mm. they said that uh, the maid at the top of the stairs, Velma, she had a clump of black hair in her hand which seemed like it was something defensive and Roger's hair at the time. Uh, he was more of like an ashy kind of gray hair. Like he didn't really have dark black hair. And everyone's like, well, whose hair could it be? I'm like, well, Marjorie's got black hair. I think she did at the time. So, I mean, could have been her. I don't know how they didn't detect this. I mean, this is back in the seventies. So DNA wasn't what it was or was it is what isn't what it is today. Wasn't what it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do well like said. that uh, that unlike Marjorie with all of her family members and husbands, Chad is refusing to let the horse theory die. So that's cool. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Just had to throw that out there. Mm. Uh, Dave, it, would, what you... it would behoove you to entertain that Ooh. possibility. Uh, nay. Nay. <laughs> oh, damn it, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, so uh-huh. then there's the other hauntings in the house you have the there's a white mist in the library this is apparently her favorite room she was an avid reader in life maybe she is in death we had mentioned that as well about uh i think abraham lincoln's ghost where it always seems to be reading over someone's shoulder or something oh. like that but her mist seems to be floating amongst the books i thought you were just gonna bring abraham lincoln into this for no reason i'm like what <laughs> like why why is he here no, I mean, just with the whole reading situation, but it doesn't seem to be much like that. It just seems that there seems to be a, a weird mist floating in the library. Gotcha. And they see shadow figures in the basement. And then you have this weird footage that I guess we could talk about. And I played the video on stream. Oh, yeah, the uh, the mannequin thing. This was, like, when was I first saw this, first of all, I didn't think it was a ghost the first time I saw it because it was way too clear, right? We never get these super clear images you you have this isn't like the garden room or the green room or whatever greenhouse if you will and there's Allegedly. there are several mannequins in this video shot and we'll just kind of describe it for the audio listeners where you have a couple of people looks like they're standing in line for something or maybe this is just a roped off area and you see this thing it looks like a a mannequin all dressed in black and it's got like you could see clearly like the arm is bent like you can see the 90 degree angle of the arm or whatever and the arm didn't seem to be moving too much, but this thing was definitely walking in the footage. And it didn't look human to me. It looked like too skinny to be human, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it was very clear, which is, like I said, that's the first thing I noticed. was like, this is too clear to be a ghost. But it, man, like, I don't know, like the, like a couple of times watching it back, especially once I put creepy music behind it, made it way, made it way creepier. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the footage is pretty wild. If you just ghost, uh, just, if you just Google, or YouTube um, ghost at Glen Sheen mansion. You'll see it. It made the news. So the, the news, I pulled that out of the news clip, but it was uh pretty creepy. I'm glad you played it multiple times during the episode though, because at first I'm like, that's definitely just a person moving. Mm-hmm. And then when you watch it, like the second and third and fourth time, you're like, it's not. And then like you get thrown off a bit. Cause you're like, why aren't these people looking at it? But they're clearly staring at something else in the room. Like, mm-hmm. like you said, it's roped off. So they're, looking at the exhibit or whatever, but yeah, that was a, uh, it's a little different, a little it was different. Very, than... very weird footage. What were your thoughts on it, Dave? On the footage? Yeah. It just, it, it freaked me out. It wasn't, 
it didn't uh i don't i didn't think it looked fake at all i thought it was just it was creepy and it was moving in a very un natural fashion too it was it was it was, it was unsettling it was like it was, it was walking but it was very bouncy it was yeah. just weird it was really weird footage and they had um some experts analyze the footage and everything and one group was like i we have no explanation for this the people that were in the room and caught the footage were like i didn't see this when we were here and then you had one other paranormal group that tried to debunk it they said no it's just another mannequin and they said the camera's moving it's not moving but that's why no I replayed way. it so many times. I was like, no, this thing is absolutely moving in this footage. Really creepy. The only explanation would be, because it was kind of moving behind somebody standing there, right? Was may maybe someone was picking up was a mannequin and moving mannequin it? mannequin up and moving it. Or it might, it might move in that kind of fashion if somebody was carrying it. If you're carrying it, you know it. I mean? or it could be riding a horse. Uh, I was just going to ask if you thought mm -hmm. if it was a horse. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, Stephanie said it was galloping. Yep, see? Mm. <laughs> yeah. It was real creepy. I got to say, the one thing that came up to start this with the ghost, and it's been in multiple episodes, one of the things I find the creepiest, even though we've probably heard it 10 times at least on the show, at minimum, seeing the ghost in the window while you're outside is terrifying for some it reason is. to me. It's just, that's the one that like kind of shivers. Yeah, almost like it's down looking down at you. Yeah, I, I have, have a picture. picture. Oh, I, I have a picture saying. queued up here. I also and, have one. Uh, I wonder if it's the same one. So I'll pull up this one first. The one and we'll have... This is one um, where they believe they see the woman in the window. To me, my... Oh, man, that's kind of a creepy face, huh? Oh, yeah, it's kind of creepy. I don't know if I buy this picture. I think Yikes. it looks way too big, but I don't want to dismiss it. And I also don't know the source. This is just Google Glen Sheen Ghost. It was from this window up here. Yeah. So that's a second story window ghost. I guess when you zoom in a whole bunch, who knows, for those of you... Audio listeners, we pulled up an image that is allegedly of a ghost at Glenshine Mansion. Pretty creepy face. Looks like it has like a big, wide mouth. Almost looks yeah. like a skeleton face. Yeah, Sorry. this. I think this is more unsettling than you guys are letting on. This is a terrifying photo. It really exactly. is. If it's not photoshopped, which if it is photoshopped, they did a pretty good job. They did a pretty good job photoshopping. Yep. Uh, Dave, did you share yours? Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of hard to see. It's in the top right window there. You can, uh, yeah, it's kind of far away. I can't zoom in. Can you zoom in on that? I don't think so. I think I'm fully zoomed in. Oh, wait, maybe. Oh, just, oh, uh, just with your mouse wheel, just scroll up. Yeah, just, hit, just, just be an adult one time for me, Dave. It's in this window. If you look, can you see my mouse thing? That little hand. She's I see like fourteen faces here in the corner here. That's it's kind of pixelated. If I go out a little bit, allegedly there's, there's like a head I see here. a clear head right there. Yep. Yeah, and a neck. And I think the shoulders are here. So, uh, uh, I see it now. Yeah. <clears throat> Creepy. And I do wonder, like, how many, because this is in broad daylight. The other one's at night, so that one's a little bit more um, obvious that nobody would be in the building. I wonder how many times people get footage that's like, I caught someone in the window, and it actually is just some asshole inside the house looking out the window. Yeah. You know, that one looks, that one's creepy, though. Actually, all of these images, everything that we've gotten from this house has been unbelievably creepy. The one you no. shared is is like a little terrifying, but that one you shared before, I don't know. That one that one sent a shiver down my sides. It was a little more terrifying to me. It for had some a reason. horrifying face with a giant smile. So yeah, I would say if that's a legitimate photo, then that's actually pretty terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, seem to have me at a disadvantage, Mr. Ed. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a good call Great back reference. there, Matthew T. <laughs> This uh, this was a good story. I was not fully, not fully. I'd never heard of this particular place until you had brought up that you were covering it. Where did you uh, where did you come across the story? I was I had read about it a while ago in the I think it was the Haunted America book. Let me double check. He leaves. I mean, he didn't need to leave. But that's he just fine. rolls away. All right, I just read the whole book. Yes, it was in there. Uh, <laughs> Haunted America. This has got a bunch of different locations. Um, very brief discussions on them. So I, I had pulled it up. I was like, oh, that seems like a decent one. We haven't done Minnesota yet. So I was like, let me go back and do Glenshean Mansion. And then I just fell down this rabbit hole of Marjorie and all of these people that she absolutely allegedly killed. Yes, absolutely, allegedly. <laughs> and I was like, "Damn, this story just keeps going and going." There's another one where I was like, "I gotta, I gotta cut down a lot of her stuff." 
I cut down most of her arson stuff, but there's more arsoning. Is that a word? Arsoning? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so there's more. Cool. There was definitely more arsonifying that went on in her <laughs> life, as well as uh, more poisoning. So something the to look into. Arsonification of Marjorie. I forget her last name. <laughs> Congdon, but I'm sure it changed 14 times with every yeah. single husband. So probably quite a few. I just uh, googled arsoning. Uh, it's not what you think it means, but there, it, it, there is a definition in the Urban Dictionary, and it is a cool male person, guy who gets all the girls, wears bling bling. Oh, arsoning, an arsoning. That's right. not a thing. That's not real. That sounds awful. That's that's yeah. Not, not even it. cool as as uh, yeah. arsonist. Yeah, that's pretty garbage. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> so this house is still open. Um, they have they're pretty active on like social media and stuff so you could go there you could do a tour but apparently the tour guys don't like to talk about ghosts they also don't like to talk about murder which reminds me a lot of the rough point mansion so mm, i was gonna say i was just going to say if you're determined enough you can get the answers out of them i did and that's pretty much that's pretty much the story you got them to tell you what they wanted what you got them to tell you what you wanted to hear at How rough point it? yes yeah yeah, they they would not admit to uh, her. Like, yeah, fine. There's, there's ghosts. Fine. Yeah, just get out of here. <laughs> you go back to rough point. Those are some good ghost stories. That uh, you know, breaking news. It was breaking news here at hometown ghost stories that the rough point mansion was haunted. Newport, Rhode Island. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back and check it out. It was, it was a good one. Uh, so after you said you were doing Duluth, Minnesota, I looked into it a little bit. And there's a lot of haunted locations, a lot of haunted schools here. There's three high schools in Duluth, all claim to be haunted. Um, do you guys want to hear about Denfield Community High School? Yes. Do you want me to read it in my normal voice or do you want me to do the speakeasy voice? Oh, you got to do the speakeasy voice. Can you mix a little speakeasy in Minnesota together? Or is that too much? I know you're oh. I know you're just coming out of your shell with these accents, but um, let me start with the speakeasy one and I'll see what we can do from there. So oh. for, before you jump into it, <laughs> for those it. of you who are wondering, we had a little meeting today on how to be better on social media. Yes. And, you know, the speakeasy is a great YouTube channel with a lot of good content. Actually, we reference some of their content. But they talk weird. So now we're going to talk weird and see if we get popular <laughs> on the YouTube I do like their channel. You should check it out. I wasn't lying. It's great. There's good content on the channel. They have great content. They're the voice that they use. Um, it is. It's a thing. <laughs> Opened in 1905 at Ir as Irving High School, the Denfield High School Auditorium is rumored to be haunted by several different spirits. According to legend, several students died after falling from the catwalk above the stage, and others allegedly committed suicide. One popular story, eh, claims that a student was murdered beneath the stage, and now it haunts it. Others claim that the spirit of a former teacher is seen wandering the hallways after school hours. Additional research for this allegedly haunted location is currently in progress. <clears throat> that was uh, that was pretty well done. It was convincing. Thanks. But it was distracting, and I have no idea what you just said. I actually didn't <laughs> gather a single piece Not a of single information from anything word you just said. I retained. <laughs> All right, open in 1905 as Irving High School. The just Denver. summarize it. You can't repeat everything you just said. All right. Um, several students died after falling from the catwalk above the stage, and others allegedly committed suicide. So the, that's at the high school auditorium. Um, right. Yeah, that's, that's a crazy story. And there's also the SS William A. Irvin. In Duluth, so I can either read this one in the accent, or do you guys want it normal? I think I just want you to read it. I think I want to go back to <laughs> I want to go back to what we're what we're used to here. All right. So, built in 1937, the SS William A. Irvin is said to be haunted by the spirit of one of its former captains, as well as get them ready. Oh no, no way! The spirit of a woman in white. Oh, okay. Two other unknown spirits <laughs> are said to haunt the ship, and visitors report hearing disembodied bangs. All right, so one second. Um, if you have kids, I'm sorry. Cover their ears. The fuck is a disembodied bang? I think it's just a, a bang. It's just it's a just bang. A, it's a bang with no source. Disembodied means divorced oh. from the source of whatever made the noise. All right, stop rapping. Disembodied bang. Divorced from the source, of course. It's a horse. <laughs> <laughs> no more. 
It was the end of the hometown ghost stories freestyles. You'll never get it again. I hope you liked it. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> Visitors report hearing disembodied bangs, moans, and other unexplained noises. The SS William A. Irvin was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1989. So there's other places in Duluth. We might end up going back there at some point. But uh, those are just some quick examples of other haunted locations. Like every school in this place is absolutely haunted. So there, there's uh, there's other tales to tell in the town or city. I'm guessing it's a city. I'm guessing it's rather large. If they have three high schools, I didn't look at like their capita and stuff like that. But three high schools means that you're relatively big, right? Like probably a city. Yeah, yeah you got to be a decent sized city. Hmm. We could also probably talk about the ghost of the Minnesota Vikings and that trash franchise that keeps losing. I get a lot of Vikings fans that listen to this, especially in the Minnesota episode, Rob. Uh, the frauds. The Vikings. Yeah. The Chargers of the NFC. The Duluth is a port city. Yeah, it is a city. So now we know. Can you reread that in the speakeasy voice for me? Duluth is a port city in the United States in the state of Minnesota. You gotta draw it out a little more. It would, right. be, it would be Minnesota. A little bit more of a <laughs> okay. A draw. Uh, yes. Is it All right. would that be a draw? All right. So we're gonna do the wheel spin for anybody that hasn't already type stickers in the chat. Now we'll enter you into a wheel spin. Go the ahead. wheel spin is last. We are gonna do our five star reviews first. Okay, well, I can inform the people that they can still get in on the stickers oh, if they need to. So if you haven't already, just type stickers in chat and I will enter you in to the contest. I am going back through and finding all the ones that I missed right now. Go ahead, Rob. All right. So as I get them together, we have one from Vincent Wolf. It's titled Great Show. I've been a fan since the beginning. Great storytelling and personalities. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Um, we also have one from Parzival, who I think left this one before, and this is an update. Best podcast. Been listening for nearly a year now and have become a big fan. Listen to you guys every week. Always look forward to the next story. Keep up the great work, guys. Hope to hear about the suicide force in Japan and the upcoming pods, maybe. Very interesting. I'm sure we will definitely cover that at uh at dark. dark. That is dark. It is quite a dark story. Um the next one is from No Cufflinks, and it's titled, Not Sure If I Enjoy the Host or the Actual Stories More. Always been into these types of stories since a kid. These guys' storytelling abilities are second to none, so thank you, No Cufflinks, for that. And then we have two uh, pretty, one really in-depth good one, and one that is relatively funny. And it's titled Only But the Finest from Hans von Gutenschleiber, of course, <laughs> if anyone was wondering. Almost covered, so, almost covered Germany this week. He would have been happy. My, my beloved wife Gretchen and I have been looking for a new podcast to occupy our time. The days are long and silent at the cannery. We would can from dawn until dusk with nothing but silence to break up the day. That is until we stumbled upon hometown ghost stories. Never have we had a dismal day at the cannery since we began binging this wonderful <laughs> program. Perhaps after but a few more years of labor at the cannery, might we be able to afford a television to attend the live stream? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Hans, for your hope, hope things go really well for you and your wife there at the cannery. And thank you for listening to Hometown Ghost Stories. Uh, this one is from the Mick, and this is a excellent review. It was titled Second Attempt because he tried to leave it the first time and was uh, was rejected, but he persevered and got this review through to us. My first attempt didn't post, but I wanted to tell you that I love your podcast. I drive semis for a living and spend my days listening to various paranormal and true crime podcasts. I was first introduced to you guys thanks to Haunted American History, which is also a great show. Um, just side interjection. I think we're working on something where the host of that show is going to come on and do an episode with us in the future at some point. So look forward to that. Um, and that show is great, by the way. If you haven't listened to Haunted American History, definitely go check it out. I've already heard many of the stories you feature, but love the fact that you guys seem to still find aspects and facts that are new to me. 
For instance, the Velisca Axe Murder House heard that story dozens of times, but never once heard about the bacon. You guys had me in tears to the point where I had to pull over because I was having trouble seeing. The mixture of historical fact, legend, and hilarious banter makes your show a must listen. I've binge listened for the last two weeks and I'm completely caught up now. I look forward to seeing what else you have in store. Keep up the great work, Rich C. So thank you very much, Rich. And I'm glad that you decided to pull over and knock into an accident um, listening to our show. However, thinking about it a little bit more over the week, if you had gotten into an accident and it got out that you got into an accident because you were listening to us and we were so funny that it, you know, caused you to crash the semi truck, that might be good advertising for us. I'm just saying, if you really so want to help funny, show, it'll ruin your life. <laughs> it might be the worst take we've ever had on this show. <laughs> But well, thank you for the review. That was actually one of the better reviews. Yeah, actually, I went, I went back and listened to that episode review. because of that review. I was like, was it that good? And uh, it was. It, it held up. It held up. It was a fun, fun conversation about an absolutely brutal event. Yeah. So that's one of our talents here is our diagnosed sociopath. Yes. Isms. Yeah. All right. Let's spin a wheel. Huh? Let's spin so, a wheel. So uh, for those in chat. If you don't see your name on this wheel and you did enter the contest, I apologize and I will enter you in twice next time if need be. Andrew taught me a trick, which is F11. Boom. Look at that. Okay, we're going to spin this wheel and we're going to pick out a winner. Winner gets a five yes. pack of limited edition. All right, there goes the wheel. It's on around. There it goes. Turn it, spinning, spinning, spinning. It's starting to slow down. It's coming close. It's coming up and it has fallen on Captain McSlugs and everybody boos in unison. <laughs> I think that that, he, that we're all fans of Captain McSlugs. We're gonna we're gonna give it one more spin here as well. Congratulations, Captain McSlugs, and we'll pick a second winner. And there goes the wheel. It's spinning and spinning and spinning around as it goes, as it goes. Who's it? Where's it gonna land? Nobody knows. And spin it again, Jesse. She already won. No, she has two kids. Now oh, they each true. get their own. That's fair. Batch of stickers. No, that's fair. we've been waiting for them to win <laughs> stuff for weeks. Yeah. So Stephanie, uh, no, that was Sydney B, right? That's Either Stephanie way, again. Same house. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sydney, uh, congratulations, and you are the champion, and we're going to send you now two packs. They're going to your house. Tupac. Wait, S did Stephanie just call me an ass? All right, never mind. Yeah. You don't win. Forget it. I'll right, <laughs> spin the wheel again. Jeez, I'm sticking up for you and stuff. All right. No, no, I'm just kidding. You do win. You do win. <sighs> Anyways. Congratulations. Right, so. Where are we off to next week? So, we are going to cover another state that we haven't covered. Um, it came to my attention that i am doing episode next week is episode number 66 but i will also be doing episode number 69 which ironically falls on valentine's day so i was researching several different stories and i found a story about the oldest brothel in america that is haunted by a bunch of different spirits that we're going to be covering in butte montana so we're going to be going to Butte, Montana and covering that. What I want the chat to do, so you're going to have a few weeks to do this. I know what I'm covering for episode number 69. It is a love story. We're not going to say what it is. If you can guess it, it doesn't have to be in the chat right now. If you can guess it on Discord or whatever, we'll send you some stickers as well. But see if you can guess the love story that I am covering on Valentine's Day. And you two already know, so you can't say anything. But it's oh, uh, okay. it's you quite a story. Did it did it sound like we were going to say something? And that oh, moment I, of silence. I know, I know your your horse tricks, Dave. <laughs> My horse trickery is legendary. Yeah, it is. It is legendary. Mm. Um, Stephanie, we've already covered Bonnie and Clyde, so that is not the answer. Bonnie nice. Let's, uh, let's thank our patrons real quick while everyone. Uh, Thinks about that, gets the wheels turned there. Mm. For our VIPs, we have Jeannie R, Justin T, Lisa J, Mike B, Mom and Pops W, Robert H, Stephen V, and Demon King. Thank you guys for being VIPs. Also, Demon King, thank you so much for throwing down $30 in Super Chat yesterday on our special live stream. So thank you guys so much. Uh, other other patrons, we have Allison V, Anna C, Even Better Hometown Ghost Stories, Lily, Jake V, Mar Fire, 
Rachel B, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Anthony Angry Dave Rocks T, Brandon W, Brennan B, Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Huggy Bear, Carrie Lee J, Mark M, Matthew T, Mariah M, Papa Squatch, Sarah R, Sarah W, Solar Flare, Soph, and Hooper. Thank you guys so much for being on Patreon, and we will continue to read your names out. And thank you profusely because it's awesome. Did somebody actually hit, just hit bingo? Stephanie got bingo too. Stephanie got bingo and two batches of stickers today. <laughs> I never believe her. Sometimes she can be deceitful. Yes. Misleading. Yes. Horse trickery. Horse trickery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see a bunch yes. of people just typing stuff in chat. I think they want us to uh, say things for their bingo cards, but we're not going to say it. No, yeah. we're not going to fall for your horse trickery. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. You have to add horses uh, to the bingo card for next week. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie says, Dave must have cursed me. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's not a good uh, Friday we have cursed possession coming out. We have mm -hmm. what? What the heck? What do we crying cover? boy painting? Crying boy yes. painting, and then uh, next. Tuesday. Listen to Jesse not know what we were talking about for ten straight minutes. <laughs> I completely thought you were talking about a different painting, but <clears throat> <laughs> cursed paintings a cursed painting, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, there are some. Yeah. And then uh, no the. Tuesday after next, we're going to New Jersey covering Clinton Road. Ooh, that's going to be fun. We haven't done New Jersey yet either, right? We have not. Of all the states we haven't covered, I found it weird that we haven't covered New Jersey yet. It is pretty close. Mm. Pretty close to where we're at. We're in Massachusetts. so yeah. We could take a road trip over the next two weeks to Clinton Road. Could do it. It's a long drive for mm. a road, though. <laughs> it would be so. a road trip. Oh, how, how long by horseback? <laughs> I don't trust horses. Judging that you survived the trip. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, let's yeah. get out of here. Let's All land right, this cool. plane, Jesse. Yes. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back on Friday. So check it out. And we'll see you guys on Tuesday for another live episode. Appreciate you. going on everybody thank you for making it through another episode of hometown ghost stories if you like that video hit like if you loved that video hit subscribe and if you hated that video well then why are you still here either way join us on all of our live shows every tuesday night 9 p.m eastern standard time that much is guaranteed but sometimes we do surprise shows we don't tell anyone we'll just show up with a live show one day and you won't know about it unless you have that notification bell turned on. So if you don't, turn on that notification so that you don't miss any of our impromptu live shows. Catch us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, comment live, watch your comments pop up on the screen, interact with us, make fun of us, whatever. And if you want to support the show, leave us a five-star review on iTunes and we'll read it out loud live on the show. Also, for as little as $3 a month, you can subscribe to us on Patreon and join the legendary cast of patrons with your name in the credits. Plus, you'll gain access to all the extra bonus Patreon-exclusive content that we have on that platform. Either way, we'll be here next Tuesday with a brand new episode. We'll see you then. <sighs>